Oh, hello. Welcome. My guest today is Peter Adkisson, the founder and first CEO of Wizards of the Coast, the man who sold Wizards of the Coast to Hasbro in 1999. Yeah. Peter is also the owner of Gen Con, which uh, you've probably heard of, one of the biggest gaming conventions in the world. Is that fair to say? Uh, let's see. It's the largest tabletop game convention for consumers. And All right. We're at about 65,000 unique attendees each year. Fantastic. So yeah. I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you here in Thank the you. belly of the beast at, at Tularean Community College. And the very first question, I'm going to throw it out. We're going to get right to it. My very first question to you. This is what I actually asked people, what should I ask him? And overwhelmingly, every response is, why? Why did you sell Wizards of the Coast <laughs> why did to sell Hasbro? Wizards of the Coast? Wow, you're starting right, go right, right with it. Why did you sell right, Wizards right, of the right, Coast to Hasbro? Right, right with Whammy. Well, um, first of all, I, even though I was the founder of Wizards of the Coast, I, I didn't own Wizards of the Coast. I have Wizards of the Coast stock, and a lot of other people have Wizards of the Coast stock. Um, I came from a pretty modest background, mm -hmm. raised raised in a farming community in Idaho. Um, and um, uh, I didn't have any money when I started the company. So uh, we financed Wizards through, um, through investments from other people. And also uh, every employee had shares in the company as well. And so when we got to a certain size, you know, when we were small, nobody cared. You know, people get stock in the company and think, oh, it's probably not worth anything, whatever, right? How, how cute. <laughs> so then uh, when Magic came out, and our revenue and profit started going off the charts up and to the right. Uh, people started getting out their calculators and figuring out th what their net worth was and going, oh, well, okay. But they couldn't really actually buy a house with you know, this paper stock in a privately held company. And so um, there ended up being a lot of pressure uh, in the mid 90s uh, for what's called a liquidity event mm -hmm. um, within the company. And in other words, for people to cash out this stock that they have, convert it to money and go improve their, you know, their, their lifestyle, you know, their standard of living. Um, people, we had employees that were worth, that were millionaires on paper. Wow. Uh, but no way of actually using that cash and or converting that to cash. And so um, we, you know, we brought in investment consultants, people that could help us solve this problem. What do you do with a privately held company? Uh, when the shareholders want liquidity. And um, uh, we were given several options. You could do an IPO. Turned out we weren't really uh, the type of company that would do well as an IPO. Uh, we did seriously consider doing a, uh, a leveraged buyout where you get a big investor to come in and buy out most of the shareholders. Um, and I can go into why that ended up not really being that attractive to us. Um, but the other was just to sell the company. And so it was really pressure from the shareholders and employees who, who wanted to get um, cash for that. And now, if I would have really not liked the idea, then maybe I, it wouldn't have happened. But you know, by, by 1999, I'd been doing it for nine, almost 10 years. Sure. Um, and you know, I really started Wizards of the Coast to make games and um, lots of games, not just uh, you, you know, a couple of big games. And Magic got to the point where um, the company got big enough, it was, became very difficult for us to experiment with small, with small games. Like, oh, still a one-off board game or a one-off card game or role-playing games and, and, and so on and so forth. So it became, um, it became less of a playground and more of a well, what do you do with Magic the Gathering, you know, 10 years after it's launched, right? I mean, now it's 30 years after it's launched, sure. right? You know, um, and that, that sort of challenge of, of how to manage Magic, and at the time, Pokemon and Dungeons and Dragons, um, over time became less interesting mm -hmm. for me. And so the combination of all these factors said, hey, you know, let's cash out, go do sure. something else. Do you ever regret selling you ever think maybe that could have, you know, maybe I wish I had not done it that way? You know, I always thought that I, I didn't think I had any regrets at the time. And I always told myself I never would. But I kept expecting that oh, maybe someday you'll regret it. And I, I you know, I really never have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's a wonderful company and I'm really proud of 
having been the CEO for Wizards for 10 years, um, for doing the TSR acquisition, the Dungeons and Dragons acquisition, and for bringing Pokemon uh, to America and so on. But um, it's, it's really nice to move on and do other things in your life and, and stuff. So no, no regrets. What are some of the things that Hasbro coming in as this billion dollar multinational corporation has been able to do or was able to do in uh, taking over ownership of uh, Wizards of the Coast that, that you as an independent company could never do. And you remained on actually for two years? Uh, a little over a year actually. A little over Until a year. early 2001. So yeah. did you witness some dramatic changes in terms of, oh wow, we could have never done that and now suddenly you had the ability or have you seen stuff since then where it's like, oh wow, like what I'm getting at yeah. is what Hasbro yeah. Yeah. Has, is able to offer that you, you could never do without them with the game. So, um, first of all, disclaimer, you know, I, I have no idea what's happened at Wizards with Hasbro over the last 18 years, right? right? So what's happened since then, if Wizards has helped, uh, or Hasbro has helped Wizards in certain ways that I don't know about, that's sure. entirely possible. But I think we um, sold to Hasbro a company that was very good at making trading cards. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, we were very good at making magic cards, making magic sets, uh, getting them printed, getting them shipped, distributing them, doing or organized play. Um, we were already in the distribution in the mass market to the extent we wanted to be. Hasbro uh, was not really able to bring anything to Wizards um, except in one arena, and that is media in terms of, of like a movie deal or, or a TV series or something like that. Now, that hasn't happened yet. No. <laughs> 18 years, but no. every few years there's another rumor, right? Like, oh, there's gonna be, I, I guess the latest one is Netflix. Uh, Netflix, Netflix by the Russo brothers of Marvel fame. Yes, yes, okay, well, great. I mean, that's something, we tried to get some sort of deal like that uh, for a movie or TV series and um, we didn't have the right connections. Uh, we didn't have, you know, it wasn't in our DNA to go out and, and try to get a movie deal done or a TV series or something like that. Uh, but Hasbro has um, uh, seemed very keen on that. Um, and uh, so uh, if that eventually happens, then we'll, you know, then great. I, 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 know, I think also to Hasbro's credit, even though I can't get up there and say, oh, Hasbro did these great things for Wizards, I also don't think Hasbro did anything to screw it up either. That was my next question is, do yeah. you feel that one of the fears, so Magic players also, we don't always know where the sausage is coming from as, right. as the saying goes. And right. so a great uh, item of conversation is when certain announcements are made, we speculate just as, as, as interested consumers and engaged players, was this something that Wizards of the Coast thought of and wanted to do, or was this perhaps the corporate overlords coming in and saying, this is what we want to happen, you must comply? Uh, 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 on the reverse, is there anything in terms I, of like, I, this is a I, corporate I, ownership, it's got its fingerprints you, all over it? You know, hu humans. Right. Humans do stupid things. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, I think that if there's anything that you don't like that Wizards did, you could you could blame it on whichever faction makes you feel more comfortable, we right? We I, mean, I just, uh, I, I don't, um, you know, I think, you know, we, when I was there in the, the brief time post Hasbro acquisition, you know, we did arm wrestle a bit about uh, the best way to distribute magic cards in the international markets, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I, I think those are kind of minor grievances in, in, in the overall scheme of things. Um, and I don't know what's happened again in the last 18 years. I think that um, though Hasbro's never screwed around with how the magic cards get designed, really. And that's the important part, really. Like, sure. like, like how many cards are in a set and what do the cards do? And, you know, Hasbro's never came in, to my knowledge, and said, you know, you got to add a sixth color to Magic. That's just what this game needs. Uh, you know, they didn't do anything like that. They certainly sent their own corporate guys in to watch the money. I would do the same thing if I was them. I mean, you know, things like that. Um, but um, as far as I know, I think Wizards has been left to do what it does best. And that Hasbro recognized that this was a chance for them to get into what was a growing market called you know, hobby games or tabletop games, mm -hmm. you know, not the mass market type of stuff that Hasbro was already famous for, like the monopolies and so forth like that. But this, this market of Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, now all the plethora of board games that are coming out and other trading card games, this market 
has gotten bigger than the mass market tabletop games like the Monopolies. It's, it's the biggest market for, tab you know, for tabletop games is this segment that used to be a small little cousin to the mass market games. And so for Hasbro, it was a chance to buy the market leader in that category with the two most important brands, Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, and also at the time, Pokemon, and uh, really come into that category and, and have the leading company. And I think came with that an understanding like, hey, we don't really know this category that well, so let's not mess it up. It makes them a lot of money, according to uh, all the I business it reports. It's, it's uh, one of, if not their most profitable uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, brand under Transformers, I think. Yeah. So you're, you, you, you certainly handed them a very uh, a golden goose. Well, uh, the I goose think that it's, lays the, I, the golden eggs. I, I always like to say. You didn't with, hand it to them. Yeah, well, you, you got yeah, a few golden eggs, yeah, I yeah. hope. Oh, I was very happy with the deal. Yeah. I think our shareholders were very happy with the deal. I think Hasbro was very happy with the deal. I think at the time they might have thought they were paying too much, but time has certainly proven uh, that incorrect. And so I like to say, you know, Wizards of the Coast, it was built to last. What's one of the lesser known decisions that you've made during your time at Wizards of the Coast that you're particularly proud of? Doing the organized play program for Wizards of the Coast, you know, setting up Magic as a competitive um, uh, environment, an intellectual sport, uh, to model it after a sports sort of competition um, uh, with players that we would promote and um, uh, having ratings, uh, you know, a, 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 a ranking organization, qualifiers, all, the whole nine, mm -hmm. nine yards of what that is. Um, I feel proud of that because um, as the CEO at the time, it wasn't a popular decision. It was, we certainly had Richard's uh, support. We wouldn't have done it without, you know, we, wouldn't, we never did anything without Richard's support. You know, he owned uh, the biggest chunk of the company and, and he's a really sharp guy. So I, I like, I, I, I feel that that was sort of our smartest moment in terms of, uh, of looking at where, uh, we were also having market problems uh, with the in the in the um, aftermath of Fallen Empires, which you may know is an expansion that uh, we. Um, I have a story for you about Fallen Empires. Oh, I've got yeah. Okay, we can go there for sure. Um, so I think that that was. Um, uh, I think that's the part I'm most proud of in terms of my and just you know the role. It wasn't my idea. It was the right. role I played in terms of of pivoting the organization uh, to mm -hmm. do that. It was the '90s. Yes. I had just gotten into Magic the Gathering. I was 16 or so years old, and I loved Magic the Gathering. And my father, wanting to uh, support me and reward me, said, you know what? I'm going to get you a gift for this new game you're playing. I'm going to buy you a whole box of it. We went down to the... Lo I'd only been buying Revised. I knew nothing. I was still new to the game. I knew nothing of other sets, this, that. Fallen Empires, coincidentally, had come out a few weeks ago. Uh, and went down to the local game store and uh, said, I have one box of Magic the Gathering, pointed at the revised. The gentleman behind the counter said, you know, there's the new set Fallen Empires that has just come out, and we'll let you have two boxes of this for the price of one of the revised. I said, two sounds better. Dad said to me, well, what do you want? Whatever you want, same price. I said, two sounds better than one. And as I opened them up and began asking, why are there no, uh, where's the nightmare? Where's the Shivan dragon? Where's the dual lands? I don't understand. These cards don't look very good. What's going on? That's my experience with Fallen Empires. That was a doozy. That was a yeah. doozy. How important was the role of the local game store uh, in the early days of Magic the Gathering and other products that Wizards of the Coast made? The, the role of the game stores uh, has always been huge. I mean, really important. Um, the, um, because, you know, Magic is not a, a, a simple game. Uh, it's not a game that's easy to learn by just reading the rules. Um, and it, now, of course, there's communities of magic, and there's all sorts of resources going online and so on and so forth that you can uh, find to help you learn. You can go to uh, Tolarian Community College. Woohoo! Um, but in those days, there wasn't the internet. And so the retail stores became, uh, were a very important sort of community center where you go and play magic, play events, and, and play with other people. So. The retail stores were really important, and we tried to um, steer retailers, you know, in as, as best we could, toward how to make their store 
you know, a great environment, which is always kind of awkward because we weren't retailers until the late 90s mm -hmm. ourselves. But, you know, say, hey, good lighting, places to play games, teach the game, sell singles, run tournaments, all these sorts of things. Um, uh, we believed that that environment was absolutely crucial to uh, games like Magic the Gathering and later Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop games in general. And um, I was always, uh, I, I like to study how Games Workshop did stores um, uh, before Magic became popular, starting in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> Games Workshop had really mastered this sort of philosophy with how they set up their stores and, and selling their products. And so, yeah, stores are, are, are very, I, I don't know how Wizards views it these days. I imagine they, they um, uh, you know, I, lots of, still has, happens in stores, right? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. do, 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 you think, do you think that there could be a time where magic could exist solely at say like Walmart and on Amazon and that there there is no local game store selling magic could it just be at Walmart or something that is delivered to your home via Amazon but without any of that well, or well where do most games of magic are played the local in my opinion at the local game store well, then you need to I'm, I don't have research yeah. teams but I mean is. yeah I mean you need to people magic is a game that gets played I mean people play magic they get together with their friends and play magic and they get together you know doing tournaments doing drafts doing leagues um all these sorts of things require a community center <laughs> a a game store seems to be the ideal place for that to happen and i i would hope that that continues to be the case um it doesn't do any good to live at home alone and have a huge pile of magic cards right yeah you know and i think magic uh thrives because of the tournament scene and so um, I, you know, I imagine with the big tournaments Wizards does themselves with the, uh, event organizers, mm -hmm. but um, don't a lot of the sort of local tournaments that feed into, does it still work that way? I don't know. I haven't been involved it, in a long it time. It did up until very recently. We've just seen some dramatic changes oh in my. that that have a lot of players uh, and professional Magic players spooked. Uh, uh, it, it, it does still work that way. But they're, they're, uh, uh, as people are, tend to get nervous, there's a lot of panic right. that that priority may have changed. You used the expression just a moment ago that uh, uh, the competitive scene uh, tournament play is what allowed Magic to thrive. You used the word thrive. Yeah. Can you yeah. tell me more yeah. about that relationship? Because I am very curious about how the competitive scene tournaments, Magic tournaments, had helped Magic thrive. Right, right. Um... It was huge for us, uh, at least we believed it, it to be. Um, and you have to go back to the Fallen Empires story. Fallen Empires was such an important uh, uh, my, uh, you know, point in time. Um, when the bubble bursts uh, at Fallen Empires and, and Magic you know, had reached its peak, and first time ever we supplied too much product, and, and um, uh, then in the wake of that, is when we decided that we really wanted to shift the focus of the game towards competitive play, and um, and so we be, you know we believed that uh, organized play would help the game thrive, and that, that by branding it as an intellectual sport and doing all the tournaments and so on that we did, and the prize money, and the promotions of it, the international aspects of it, having tournaments move around, our international partners were very excited about that. Um, it. We believe we, re we successfully repositioned the brand in marketing terms from being a brand that stood for uh, collectability and speculation to a brand that was about um, tournament play and competition. And we deliberately took steps to make the game more complex throughout the 90s, from the early 90s to the late 90s and perhaps after that as well. Um, you know, we made the cards more complex. Uh, we uh, to reduce the role of randomization in the game mm -hmm. to increase the odds that somebody who was more skilled would win more more often versus mm -hmm. somebody who was less skilled, um, and so on. And um, uh, the the feedback that we got was phenomenal. And I think that even though the sales dipped down after Fallen Empires, um, they then turned and started going back up again and to the right. And certainly. The feedback that we were getting through our market research and through distributors and international partners and retailers was that the organized play program saved the game. Wow.
What about the idea of selling cards direct to players? Was that ever anything that came up where, where somebody could just purchase, we can eliminate the middleman of uh, distributors and local game stores and just buy a booster box from Wizards of the Coast direct? Uh, yeah, so we did sell direct. We mm -hmm. had an online store and we sold Magic direct to uh, consumers. Um, we uh, would only sell, we, we would never undercut um, the, the market. Like mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, we have the, what's called the three-tiered structure where, you know, retail, MSRP, right. wholesale, and, and our, um, our cost of goods and so on, right? So our philosophy was that we, never, we always wanted to support the local game stores that we believe that the game stores were really important and that um, um, that was really, we would rather everybody go buy the game store than buy directly from us. Mm. Okay. The only reason we sold direct is there were oftentimes, especially 30 years ago, um, 30, well, almost 30 years ago, um, there were places, believe it or not, that didn't have game stores. Sure. Right? There were communities of players in various places who wanted to buy Magic cards and uh, just didn't have a place to get them. So mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure the Magic cards were available that way. And so we would only sell at MSRP. We would charge shipping, which was our philosophy of like, okay, if somebody's buying from us and paying shipping and waiting a couple of days to get the cards, right. then clearly they think that that's a better situation than to get their local store. Um, and then uh, in the late 90s, we opened our own stores. Right. So we were, as a corporation, selling directly to um, consumers. But we, uh, we never yielded, we, we never uh, succumbed to the temptation of, of undercutting the retailers. Right. Because, and, 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 you know, we could, like all the other cards you're selling at, as say 50 to 60% off of retail. Mm -hmm. Like if we sold to consumers at, say, 20% off of retails, retailer, um, we could be essentially doubling our. Uh, sure. Our sales per pack of cards. So why no. not do that? Why Never not did. undercut the local game stores? Because we believed local game stores were important. Wow. And, and the distribution. In, and we didn't want to have predatorial practices with right. what we considered to be our primary customers. Sure. Do you regret any of your decisions out of the early days? Is there anything you wish you had done uh, differently in particular? I'm sure we all have long lists of this, but anything uh, yeah, uh, particularly you, you, strong? We went through a very uh, challenging transition uh, with our, our artists, mm -hmm. uh, from the early Magic the Gathering artists, and, um, and we didn't handle it real well uh, in terms of how we had to um, get certain rights back uh, for Magic the Gathering that we didn't, um, that, that we had given to artists. Uh, from, I'm talking about the very first artist, the very first right. Magic the Gathering. And so I, I wish that I would have paid closer attention to and had a better understanding of what, um, what those contracts needed to look like and, um, and would have, you know, played a, I don't know, been more intimate with the artists in, in, uh, in managing that transition. Uh, and because a lot of feelings got hurt. And I think, think there's some magic artists out there still, you know, not real happy with how all that went down. Um, you know, we got the rights we needed. So we did the right thing by the company. It was the right thing to do. But um, um, that's, I, that's always been my biggest regret is I wish that we would have, um, I wish I'd have been wiser, you know, to in, in terms of managing that, that transition. Was the reserve list a mistake? One thing's for certain. Um, throughout all this period of time in the 90s when I was there, we always tried to put the needs of people playing the game above the uh, first, prioritize that above collectors. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, it, it was it was heartbreaking to see in certain cases where we come out with a new magic expansion, you know, like Legends when it came out, where immediately, you know, the retail price day one is like ten dollars a booster pack, you know, or, or now That's, it's higher. Than, yeah. yeah, but I mean, instead of two fifty or whatever the heck right. it was supposed to be, right? And so the fact that people wanted to play the game, wanted the cards to play with the cards, and couldn't get them at at MSRP uh, standard retail price. Um, uh, was never something that we liked, never something we wanted, never something we artificially tried to manipulate the market to make that happen or anything right. like that. Uh, so um, if, uh, 
you know, so a decision to print more cards because collectors were upset mm -hmm. was certainly a decision um, that um, I, I would stand by, certainly given what the situation was in, in those days. Um, creating the reserve list, uh, there's nuances to that. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to show some ignorance here if I get into That's that okay. too far. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think there's ever, do you think the reserve list is something that should be written in stone from when it was first implemented uh, in the aftermath of Chronicles? Or do you think that there could, that, that there could come a day where enough time has passed that it is reasonable for Wizards of the Coast to say, we made this promise back in the 90s. Right. It was based on a specific instance. Uh, and we feel that decades have passed and that we are going to reprint some of those cards that we said we never would reprint. Or is, or is, it, is this like locked in uh, a stone? I, yeah, I, you know, like I said, I haven't been there in 18 years. Sure. It was, you know, it's, it's, it's dangerous territory for me to go in and comment on what was this is all just in my, this is all just opinion. This is, sort of yeah, thing. sure. Yeah, I, you know, I do think that it's, um, uh, I've certainly learned um, the pitfalls of in whether in your personal life or in a corporate life to say we will never da 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 right. right when you make a when you make a promise that locks everybody in in perpetuity um uh that that's that's dangerous to do so and and so if wizards decide well that was a promise that you know made back in peter's day and pay right. attention to it you know i mean I, wizards can do what it wants to do you know it's it's uh um uh, should they, uh, you know, I don't know. Well, I, I just mean about can they, uh, yeah. in terms of, of, uh, uh, as someone who was a CEO of Wizards of the Coast, if that's something where it's like, well, we can make that decision, you know, but, uh, it sounds like that. Yeah. Yeah. Can. I mean, I'm not there, you know, I mean, sure. companies make, uh, make promises and then to go out and break them. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's bad form. It is bad form. It, it is, is bad, bad form. form. But, uh, you know, I, it also maybe comes down to you know what really exactly was promised and mm -hmm. and what um, uh, how has it been messaged since then? You know, how has that promise been managed? You know, if Wizards has you know, come out and vigorously defended that promise and recommitted themselves every decade, then right. then, <laughs> then that's a more dangerous situation. Than, right. Uh, they, you know. <laughs> they've they've said just so you know, uh, uh, they have said, or at least they're uh, uh, the people in the company who are. Uh, the, in some ways, the current face of the company have said they wish it were gone, but they feel that they are, or their lawyers feel uh, 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 that they are, are bound to never, right. ever renege on that for fear of, of lawsuits, that it can't be done. Uh, uh, Mark Rosewater has said he wishes it were gone and that he has been the biggest fighter to get rid of it, to reprint those cards so that they can make sets that use them, they can put them out for people to play with, people want to play with them, they want people right. to play with their cards, right. but that they feel in every, that somehow this is, is just, it, 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 it'll be till the end of days, the reserve list till the end of days. Right. What we were doing in my day, I, I really don't yeah. want to try and speak to what Wizards should do yeah. nowadays, right? You know, um, but what we were, you know, as by the late 90s, when the magic market was starting, you know, we were starting to really understand it and start to figure out how, you know, develop, you know, dial in what our strategy, be, strategy should be for managing this market. We really wanted to get to the point where um, packs of cards would consistently sell at MSRP if they were part of whatever we were supporting in tournament play. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, we, we drifted towards this idea of the blocks and having our tournaments, you know, be in the current block and the previous block and, and sort of a contemporary magic and that, that we should try and supply enough cards to the market that people are buying uh, those cards at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you start talking about an individual card, if there's a card that's a rare card within that set, and how expensive, you know, if, if the, if it was, um, uh, if it was out of whack in terms of the power level of the card, and so the secondary market prices of those cards got up higher, then 
Um, I don't think we cared too much. As mm -hmm. long as you could go out and buy booster packs of, of cards at MSRP and, and have a chances of, of getting those cards or trading for those cards. You mentioned so long as the packs are selling at MSRP, did you ever have an issue where packs were being sold for above MSRP, not of uh, old sets, but of like, like a current set, a current product that you put out and you go, well, we want this to be Three dollars a pack, and it's selling for six. Or it's it's so in demand that you didn't right. have enough. Was that ever something? Well, that it, happened? It, it was what you call the old sets, um, right? When, when they were new sets, yes. Right, right. I mean, so that that was happening a lot in mm. 1994, 1990. You know, up until Fallen Empires, actually, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until Fallen Empires. Um, many good things came out of Fallen Empires, not just bad things. I mean, the the era of Magic after Fallen Empires we were much better understanding what the true demand was of the market. We were able to dial in what our print quantities should be mm -hmm. so that, so that we, didn't, we didn't have those problems as often. But you know, if that problem happened, then that was, you know, when it did, it was certainly bad that it did. But um, yeah, that was happening with, with our earlier sets, you know, the day they come out, because the growth curve was so steep Right. That it was really difficult to anticipate what the demand was. What What do you do about that? Like, is that just a case of printing more? Is that, how do you ensure that packs go for MSRP? You don't have control, for example, over a local game store, gets it in, and right. they've got one box, they've got 10 boxes, the demand's for 100. They're like, well, I'll charge yeah. eight bucks a yeah. pack then. And, and there's, that's the market, let the market decide if people are gonna pay yeah. that, but it sounds like you don't want that to happen. You want it we, at MSRP. Right. We didn't have there. What you're right. There wasn't much we could do about um, people inflating the price. So, like, let's say you know a retailer selling a two buck fifty booster pack for ten dollars, mm -hmm. you could say, man, those jerks. They've you know increased the price by fourfold. Right. Well, you're assuming that they bought the pri the product at the regular price. They may have gone out and bought that product from other retailers. They might be selling it at 10 bucks. They went and bought it across the street for seven, you know, right. uh, just so that they have it in their store. And that person bought it from somebody else for four, right? Sure. So um, you can't really come down on the retailer too hard for that. Uh, we tried to monitor with our distributors, mm -hmm. tried to um, uh, monitor how, what pricing that they were selling cards at and, and keep them from inflating the, uh, the price. And you can do that in the US. You can't always do that in other markets. In some, in, in some markets, it's maybe illegal, actually, to do it. And so uh, we always had to avoid that. So uh, really, the only answer is to have enough supply. And in the beginning, uh, up through Fallen Empires, um, every set, so Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends of Dark, we would um, decide what the print run was going to be. We print that many cards and ship them, and we had an, an internal policy of not going back on press with mm -hmm. with those cards, um, and it felt like we were needed to do that to be true to the model of trading cards and collectibles, um, collectibles. But later we um, uh, we realized, you know, as long as we're not telling exactly in the moment how many were printed. Um, who cares if a couple months later we print a few more, right? And, and they're still part of the same print run. Mm -hmm. And if we manage that carefully, and then at some point within just a few months of release, we turn off the spigot and say, okay, we're not printing anymore. Right. Then, then you know, certainly a year or two, five, ten years later, um, that really could be thought of as one print run. It, it's not sure. really going back. And so we, um, we started to do that, or it felt like we could do that mm -hmm. and um, uh, stuff. How fearful were you as a company in the early days of religious groups and others that would be offended by things such as uh, 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 the idea that, that the game might be demonic or satanic? I remember from high school, Unholy Strength was a card <laughs> yes. that had a pentagram in the background. And then suddenly in the new edition, uh, everyone noticed the pentagram was gone. Uh, uh, was this a, I mean, obviously there was a reason for that removal, but was this something where you regularly had to have discussions about, we're getting complaints from, from mother's organizations or parental groups, or I'm guessing religious organizations or, 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 or people uh, 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 very upset at demonic interference or things, or, <clears throat> and how much did you so, take that to, to heart? Um, hopefully I don't, misspeak here because okay. I don't think we changed anything because of religious pressure. Now, uh, 
I can qualify that. Yes. Now, you know, because um, I, first of all, I was raised in a very fundamentalist uh, Christian. I was uh, in environment. I was raised in, in Idaho. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a lot of crap in my early days for playing Dungeons and Dragons. Right. It was banned. It, the game was banned from the where, from the high school I was going to school at, which is a a, a private school, a religious school, and, and I was banned from from specifically banned from running the game uh, at uh, at that school, <clears throat> and so I always actually had kind of a of a, a defiance about you know mm-hmm. like like oh if religious people were upset about that. <laughs> you know, I, having religious people mad at me wasn't anything mm-hmm. new. Um, I don't remember why the pentagram went away. I, I don't remember that card. I remember I can visualize the card, but I don't remember exactly what the discussion was on 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 that. Um, I I I just don't know. I do know that um, we would often talk, uh, have conversations about whether a card was offensive for reasons that that we considered more serious, like right. if the card was sexist, right, or racist, right. Uh, you know, um, we. We had a sensitivity about that in the mid '90s that um, um, that was I, I think we were ahead of our time. In, sure. In, in in that regard, you know, we're not using a you know using gender neutral pronouns right. and all this sort of stuff like that mm-hmm. was very very important to us. So I remember those types of discussions. Um, but um, I mean, we always had demons and stuff like that yeah. in the game. Right? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Did we? I was uh, just yeah. curious if there was ever a kind of like you know like an I mean, listen the the, the this church organization or, or this mother's group is really offended at demons where this is the law lo- like like well this is the line we're not crossing yeah. this line no it sounds yeah. like you didn't really uh pay, you, pay you them know, any I, heed. Should, I hate to admit it but i was probably sort of secretly happy if anybody like that was <laughs> upset about it <laughs> that was not, <clears throat> not official hasbro sort of uh, pr- approach uh yeah but um no i didn't uh we I don't remember us ever caving uh, over that sort of thing. <laughs> and when we, and, and years later, in 1997, uh, boy, the years start to blend together. Uh, 1997, when we acquired uh, TSR, the Dungeons and Dragons uh, company, one of the first things we did is put Demons and Devils back in the game after they had been taken out of the game in like the mid 80s at right. some point after Gary Gygax got ousted. Can you tell me about, <laughs> that's a perfect transition too. Can you tell me about that? process of acquiring TSR and Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, wow. I'm interested yeah. in that. You can, you can, uh, uh, if you turn right uh, there, you can oh, see, yes. not only well, do I have, I have a few of uh, older D- D&D books yes, back you do. there. Yes, uh, you do. I, I was not a D&D player though, because I, you need those, those I acquired yep. later in life. I was not a D&D yeah. player myself. I needed friends for that. I always wanted to. Yeah. But, um, well, Dungeons and Dragons uh, was my first love as a gamer. I mean, I started up, you know, I, I played board war games as a, as a younger kid. And when I got into Dungeons and Dragons around 1978, I just loved Dungeons and Dragons uh, to death, played it a lot. <laughs> and when we started Wizards of the Coast, it was to make role playing products. We didn't start Wizards of the Coast to make Magic the Gathering. When we started Wizards, we, I had not met Richard Garfield yet. Magic had not been invented yet, right? right? So um, now our early attempts at doing role-playing games, uh, you know, uh, we had a couple of games that were critically acclaimed, which is, you know, code for, didn't sell that well, but smart people in the gaming industry really thought it was cool anyway. And so, uh, and so we actually um, uh, got out of the RPG category um, by 1995-ish or so. And, and I kind of, when we got out of that category, I kind of said, you know, that what I had concluded was that, you know, unless you had Dungeons and Dragons or maybe Vampire the Masquerade, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> it was a crappy category to be in from a business perspective. Right. So we got out of it. And when we had the opportunity to buy TSR, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, yeah, we, we jumped on it enthusiastically. And um, that was a deal I was very much very personally involved in. Um, I kind of staked my reputation um, on on the game, on on the acquisition, and thankfully it worked out really well for us and added a lot of uh, value to the company in terms of the sale. You know, mm-hmm. uh, to Hasbro, um, the the moment where I felt most 
sort of vindicated about the decision to buy Dungeons and Dragons was when Alan Hassenfeld, who was the CEO, uh, one of the original Hassenfeld brothers, um, told me, he said, Peter, the only reason we're interested in this company is because you're not a one brand company. By the fact that you have Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering yeah. um, and Pokemon at the time. It says, Pokemon's really big, but it's just a license. You know, who knows how long it's going to last. Right. But the fact that you've got the leading brands in two major categories in this industry, we really like this company. So, yeah, really feel good about the D&D acquisition and what we were able to do with the third edition, um, which we came out with. We started working on third edition D and D the the day the, the the on day two, and there's now been a Magic the Gathering and D and D crossover. Uh, I know it's about time. About time, yeah. You're in favor of that, then, yeah. Well, I always was in favor. So yeah. I remember when I was pitching my board at Wizards of the Coast to buy TSR. You know, of course, you're having to make a business case, and one of the things I'm I'm listing as like. Well, if we buy Dungeons and Dragons, then we can take the best uh, RPG you know, system and do do a setting within the world of Dominaria yeah. for Magic: The Gathering. This will be the ultimate crossover product, and it was actually one of the talking points for selling, getting my board to support it. Uh, but uh, once we brought merged the two companies together, nobody on the Magic team wanted to do an RPG with Dungeons and Dragons set in Magic. And nobody on the D and D team wanted to have anything to do with doing D and D in the world of Magic: The Gathering. It was like, okay, you just gotta. All right, I'm so glad it was that they're bit, finally uh, doing that. That's as far great. as I, as as just consumer, and what's revealed to us as consumers can tell, mm -hmm. it seemed to have been a huge success and received very well by both communities. So hopefully, we'll see more of it. But again, I only know what 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 gets made public, but it sounds like it was a huge success. Oh, that's great! Yes. I, it's good to hear. And you know, and maybe it was smart to wait, right? I don't sure. know that they needed to wait twenty years, but <laughs> you know, doing it on year one might have been a mistake. Bit much, <laughs> right? Right. Richard Garfield came up with Magic: The Gathering, but how much was the branding, the logo, the design, the look of the game something that you and Wizards of the Coast handled? That wasn't just Richard Garfield, right? How did you come up with yes. that stuff? How did you envision that? Yeah, uh, Richard had a big impact on um, the design, but yeah, he he worked as a classical sort of game designer, if right. you will. Like, here's the design of the game, but. Uh, game designer will often give prototypes of the game. So, you know, he did prototype magic cards. You've probably seen these. There's right, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's these, these things are floating around in the secondary market still. Um, these old playtest cards. And, and if you look at those old playtest cards, they look, they're laid out in the same way as a contemporary magic card, right? It's, you know, the casting cost is in the upper right. There's some sort of image in the middle, and the rules are down on the bottom, and the power and toughness are in the bottom right. I mean, that's all was from the playtest cards he did. So he, in some sense, did the design of, of how a card should look. And he was a very big fan of card games and had opinions about, you know, when you fan the cards as you're holding them in your hand, what do you see and this sort of thing. Um, and then, but that's, that's where it ended. Um, uh, in terms of the graphic design, yes, Ramir Force, who was our art director at the time, um, and Lisa Stevens, who was our sales and marketing um, uh, VP at the time, uh, who had worked at White Wolf. She was the only person in the company that had actually worked at the game company somewhere. So she, she had all sorts of special skills. Uh, and so uh, I think they collaborated a lot, but mostly it was Jesper's vision. Like, you know, probably the most common magic um, thing that you see is the back of the card, right? right? The back of the card can't change. I mean, because, you know, you, you can't be able to, you know, you gotta, you gotta be able to, can't tell the cards apart, right? Um, so, yes, we did that. And I'm um, pretty sure he did the logo, the original logo, which, um, uh, and the, the way it was packaged and sort of things like how big the cards were, mm -hmm. ultimately the, the radius on the corners, you know, a little change there between alpha, beta. Um, that was our printer. Uh, the, the original printer for Magic the Gathering was a company called Carta Monday. They're based in Belgium. They still, uh, they still print? They, they still print. Um, and so that, um, uh, the, as you got into what the cards physically looked like in the paper and what the packaging, uh, design of the packaging, not necessarily the imagery on it, but the design of the packaging, Carta Monday had um, 
a huge impact on that because again we had no idea how to package cards you know we were so naive it's really funny i mean yeah. i i remember the day luke mertens from card of monday called me and <clears throat> said well how are you going to package these cards and I, wh what do you mean so it's like well like a little box uh you know, like like the boxes and booster packs, and then the display boxes of right. you know, it was so many, you know, with ten deck boxes in a display box with thirty six boosters, and it, you know, we hadn't really thought that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, like oh yeah, and so he suggested that. Right. He suggested that this was what well, you know what the point of purchase. He called it a point of purchase display, and and it's not like. You know, we couldn't keep up with the conversation. Like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay, and and stuff. But um, yeah, that was. During your time with Wizards of the Coast, what is your overall favorite product that you came out with? Uh, just on a personal level, just it was it's it's or one of them. I'm sure uh, picking right. a favorite's hard. But what's right, your favorite right. product? Just in terms of uh, uh, that came out under your uh, uh, stewardship. Well, original magic. Well, anything, right. anything. Right. You, mean, what's no, your favorite? No, doesn't, that, we, doesn't, that, that's been the talking, answer. Yeah. That's original yeah, yeah. magic. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, original magic. Yes. I mean, like, I mean, everything after that is great. It was wonderful to do all the expansions. But, right. you know, so you, you compare to the, the, what the world was like before original magic came out mm -hmm. and then what the world was like after original magic came out. Mm -hmm. And, and th that was sort of the biggest jump forward into sort of the joy for us and millions of people around the world playing games and yeah. and it was the you know just to go back to that moment of you know here's this game it's called magic it's brand new and this is how you play it and I uh, just you know the pitch of how you would explain it to people and see people try it and just it light up their worlds mm -hmm. and seeing um, uh, just how the, the market responded so well to it uh, and it was so satisfying to be um, in, in a historical moment, right? You know, you look back to those moments in time when somebody shows you a game uh, and it has a mechanic that you've never seen before. I remember the first time I saw Dungeons and Dragons and um, the idea that the way you played, you know, a role playing a game and just this light bulb went on like, oh my God, this is so amazing um, to have had the opportunity to to create magic and, and have that experience again myself and, mm -hmm. and people around me and then for gamers all over the world wow uh, that's that's of course that's it man that's you know there are other things i really like that we did but that was by far the best you've changed a lot of people's lives in doing in doing that mine included thank well, you for that and my life was changed right by, you know and Thanks to Richard Garfield, I hope that I never ever say anything to detract from, you know, it was his invention, you know, he's, he's the man, you know, he created this game and um, I just feel so lucky that I was in the right place in the right time and had a smooth tongue, I guess, and talked to him <laughs> into letting me publish it for him, you know, I will take care of this, I will take care of you, and we'll do this thing and um, yeah, wow. So tell me a little bit about Fireside. What is Fireside? It's one of the things you're focusing right. on right yeah, now. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you. I appreciate it because I'm really excited about it. So it's called Fireside with Peter Adgison. And we, we even have a little, uh, a little set with a little fire, a fake fire that's burning uh, in it. And it's like the Fireside chat. It's like sitting around, talking. And um, our thing is like we go in search of untold stories from people be, uh, behind the scenes of, of great games. And uh, this season and next season too, uh, we're focused on Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. And so what it is, is that I sit there, like you've been interviewing me today, I sit there with people who uh, each week we have one person come in and, um, uh, and who was involved with Magic the Gathering in the very early stages. Either you know, the creation of Magic or the early days of publication, um, sort of 1991 and 1995 era. The people that I worked with that helped make it happen. So. Uh, we've had Scaff Elias on the show. Jim Lynn uh, is on the show. Richard's promised me he'll come onto the show uh, at some point. Uh, he's been down here in Portland for a while. I got to get him. You know, when he gets back up to Seattle, we've had Lisa Stevens uh, on the show. Uh, Beverly Marshall Sailing is my co-host um, for season one, 
And she was somebody who uh, I think the world of. We worked together at Wizards uh, throughout the 90s. She was our executive editor. And um, uh, so she was a, a continuous voice through the history of Wizards. And so we'll have somebody come in. We had uh, Vince Glory come in, who was um, my, uh, my mentor in business, you know. So he's uh, in his 80s now, uh, getting up there. But everything I learned about business, I learned from him. So we had him come in. Um, and so we just sit there and talk about, you know, the, those, you know, it's like, like a bunch of old people sitting around talking about the glory days, right. you know, back when we were in charge, this and is the things that we did. And this is broadcast <laughs> yes. on Twitch and then archived on YouTube, is that that's right? That's right, that's right. So uh, Fireside with Peter Atkinson, it's on Twitch, it's on Gen Con TV. Uh, mm -hmm. Gen Con TV is a, a Gen Con channel on Twitch. And so uh, each episode, uh, we're, we're doing it on Wednesdays, Pacific time at noon, um, most Wednesdays. And then it stays up there for a couple, three days, and then it gets archived on the Gen Con Videos um, site on YouTube. Cool. Yeah. So well, I'll, I'll put yeah. some links in the description. Thank I, you. I highly recommend it if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, <clears throat> especially of Magic with the Magic the Gathering talks and hearing all the old timers talk about the early days and history of Magic. It's right. an amazing resource to check out. As the uh, owner of uh, Gen Con, what do you make of Magic's diminished presence there? And what, why doesn't Magic have a stronger presence at Gen Con? Uh, uh, I, well, I mean, I mean, the short answer is you'd have to ask Wizards. I mean, we're right. certainly not keeping them, them out, right? Yeah. Um, I think that um, uh, if I were to try to be charitable to Wizards' case, I think that um, they like to have tournaments run in environments that they, they can Control more, mm -hmm. right? So if you take a um, uh, typical, what are these Grand Prix? Are they still a thing? Or Pro for Tour now, events? Yeah, Pro Tour is no longer a thing. It is now called the Mythic Championship. The, okay, Mythic Champion. Yes. Well, I bet those championships are not held in a convention with a thousand other games being played. Right. That is true. Right. And so that's the challenge: is that um, we, uh, you can go to a store, you can go to a Mythic Challenge event, and play in a tournament without having to buy a badge to a convention, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's always been a barrier to, um, from Wizards' point of view, um, to have uh, really important magic events at Gen Con or Origins or other conventions um, <clears throat> because they, um, uh, they hold somewhere else their consumers are emburdened mm -hmm. with, um, and, and then subsequently distracted by mm -hmm. all the other gaming going around them. But that said, you know, we have always had um, uh, enthusiastic tournament organizers, event organizers like Alan Hockman, for example, who come in and run a lot of magic events, whether they're to varying degrees of how official these events are and certainly not, you know, the super high profile events. Um, and there are, you know, the, there's a, a base of players that come to Gen Con that love to play magic. And yeah. so, you know, we, we get some going, but um, yeah, we'd love, to, we always say we'd love to do more. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to checking out Gen Con for the first time this year. Well, I'd love to have you out there, and um, I would love to give out some free badges to your followers oh, at Gen Con. Oh, okay. If, if you could do that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, how many badges I, do you want to give away? Uh, how about 10? Does that seem like a good number? <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> 10 sure. badges. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, if you are subscribed... Free. Free of charge. All right. If you are subscribed to Tellarian Community College, uh, just go ahead and check out uh, the link. I will also post the link on my Twitter and my Facebook for wherever you follow me to get it. And 10 Gen Con badges. That's right. Uh, being given away by the generous owner of Gen Con, uh, the founder of Wizards of the Coast. Thank you. The first CEO, the man who sold to Hasbro. <laughs> and, and, and I'll see you at Gen Con. So come party with us. Come play some games. Peter, thank you so Absolutely. much for coming here. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you for having me. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I actually, would you, would, you, would you believe that I actually like had a fear? I only tweeted out today that you were coming to right. be interviewed uh -huh. by me because I was afraid that if uh, people found out you were coming to be interviewed by me, your phone would ring. And it would be like whoever at Wizards of the Coast or their lawyer and being like, we don't want you talking to this guy. I, 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 that, that was my fear. I was just like, oh, God. So I waited till the last minute to even let anyone know. They don't even know. They don't even have my number anymore. Right. Right. <laughs>
And this program was made possible thanks to a sponsorship from Card Kingdom, as well as the Patreon support of viewers such as you. So thank you.